So good evening, everyone. I am Barbara Faranik Matonet, founder and president of the Art Circle. It is such a pleasure to see you back and a warm welcome to the newcomers. We are very happy to open our new season of webinar tonight. This evening, we will begin the season with a webinar that is very important in our heart, Beirut We Care. Of course, we are all emotionally moved by the catastrophe that happened in Lebanon on the 4th of August and again more recently. So at our level, we, the Art Circle, wanted to organize this event with four of the most prominent Lebanese artists and designer, moderated by a wonderful art consultant. We are very honored to have with us tonight Nada Debs, a world acclaimed conceptual designer who creates pieces of emotional resonance, Hiba Kalash, an artist whose practice covers installation, drawing, painting, or sculpture. Carlo Massoud, a great designer that also focuses on interior designing. Grégory Buchagian, director of the School of Visual Art at Académie Libanaise des Beaux-Arts Alba. He is also an interdisciplinary visual artist. They will be in conversation with Johanna Chevalier, art consultant and curator. She is the creator for Piazza Auction House for the sale from Beirut art and design scene. Tonight, we will see how each one of them use their extraordinary minds and strong emotions to still be creative after such a dramatic event. This webinar is part of a larger initiative to support Lebanese art in one of its worst time. On the 30th of September, there will be an auction in Paris at Piazza Auction House from Beirut art and design scene, 180 lots from Lebanese artists, gallerists, and designer will be on sale. We hope you will join in to make this auction a real success. Please help us support this great country in such difficult time and make the Lebanese art scene live on forever. Joanna, the floor is yours. Okay, do you hear me? Very well. Okay, great. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, coordinate this conversation. Well, after having discussed with each of the participants, the main thing is to understand that what is happening creatively, it's like an emotional mapping. Each one of them is very much emotionally linked to his city and country. And it's directly uh, interferes in their creativity. Here we're gonna see the first image of work of uh, Hiba. Hiba Kellarsh, and uh, she is a marvelous painter. And Hiba entitled whole, this whole installation, Kiss Me Before You Go, Beirut, I Love You. It's like a love letter to Beirut. It was, it started to be created in 2010. Of course, it's written in red as if it's written with her, with her blood. So I'll let uh, Hiba a bit present this installation. Uh, hi everyone, I'm happy to be among you. Thank you, Joanna, Barbara, everyone else. Um, I wanted to include this piece, part of the presentation, because actually the, um, the, the, what we're going through as uh, stress and shock and wars and explosions is not something new. Like as long as we remember, Lebanon has been completely politicized as a, as a landscape. So for us now, what is different is that this event happened uh, so suddenly. The shock was so big. It was very hard for us to assimilate and to go back into this work mode or our workspaces that were destroyed. So when I came back to Beirut after being abroad, first Montreal, then San Francisco for 20 years, um, I went into conversation with Beirut creating uh, this dialogue where Beirut is the lover, going back and forth between male, female, and um, changing languages between Arabic, French, English. And it went on, this series went on over four years, three different projects that were shown. So this is the importance of this project is that, again, in 2020, we find ourselves having the same conversation, but this time, What's new, I was talking to uh, my curator, Natasha Gasparian, and telling her in my studio last week 
that this time I'm definitely not able to uh, nor poeticize nor romanticize the subject matter. The pain is so high that I had to go back into my space and just simplify the language and go on into this process of art making. Um, so, I don't really uh, no, what, what, it, while we, we discussed, you said something that was very important for me and it's, it's the cell of the creation. You said before I used to dream in color, I used to see forms, I used to breathe art the whole time. Yes. And as a matter of fact, le, your brain and what you live, it's not anymore a creative space, but it became a survival space. And how, that's how we get to this piece, because uh, when I've met uh, Hiba in her studio, she was telling me how events, bombs, whatever happened in Beirut intervened oh, in any small drawing a gesture she put in her painting. And in a way it was, which is the case of the four participants, you're gonna see there is something wonderful about these artists, many artists too, but these four also, that they sublimize something that is unbearable to make it bearable. So the, the impermanence of states was also one of the painting, which was like a diary, a drawn diary. So this series where it was created Bas, based on uh, um, Beirut city maps, focusing on only on security zones and disruptions uh, around uh, the city, like geographically. So I had taken from a research done in AUB in 2008 by uh, professors there, uh, took these images, of course, took their permission then, and completely abstracting, abstracted them. This was part of the Beirut uh, exhibit art center with Marie Miraxiol. And um, going back to that space you were mentioning where today, post August 4th, I found myself in a new space in an, in an inner and exterior space that completely was numb, actually shattered, broken down in pieces. And I had to make sense of just going back into a specific like silence I needed to connect to personally in order to like go on. Of course, we all at the beginning wanted to help and we did. We all wanted to be on site, on the streets, helping our friends, helping others, we did. At the same time, I'm gonna talk for myself as an artist. I needed to feel sane again. I needed to feel that I'm not losing my mind. Honestly, I'm not exaggerating. Um, I'm, I'm not the only one who was not sleeping anymore, who was not dreaming in colors anymore, who didn't see any light for her tomorrow, nor for her kids or family. And today we're put in a position where we did not yeah, no, we did not plan for this. Of course, the situation has been the past year very difficult on us, but it was quasi manageable on a daily, on a daily uh, level. Post August 4th, I felt like I changed something completely shifted on my like inner psychological landscape, if we want to talk about that. And here it is, the psychological landscapes. It's like about small scriptures, writing, it's very nervous, you know, the, 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 the gesture, and you see parts and bits of bodies in this a hand, a foot. So I'm gonna show you three paintings which were done uh, at the same period. This is July, just before, here, June. So this is the latest series Hiba has done. Uh, uh, during and a little bit before the blast, you know, it's as if even Gregory, it was quite amazing. It's as if they felt, you know, because you, you can feel the nervousness of, or the tension in these painting versus, versus the previous one, even though it was a writing, but it was a different kind of writing. So, Hiba. What, yeah, Joanna, actually what was interesting for me, I was, I usually go in my studio space in the morning and I try to write. And uh, some parts that I realized is that today I'm not able to um, include words in my, in my like art process or rely on any 
like external um, element to create my work. It had to come from a much deeper place that I am carrying. So let's say I had used maps in the past. Of course, old works feed on the new ones. Without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. But today I had to go back and completely simplify this process and I think rely on the intuitive knowledge that we, I already held or that we already hold as artists and go back to trusting this, like simply really trusting it. And for me, it was more dealing with my studio. I had to, of course, fix it up again, rebuild it and feel that I was safe again, going back into the space because for a few weeks, no one felt safe anywhere. Even two days ago, no one felt safe. So it was, it was really about creating the safety nest and this protective space where we can be ourselves and um, go back into like feeling, I don't know, feeling uh, well and feeling living a moment. And another thing that was defined for me, I resisted letting go of the pain because I didn't want to accept that it was okay and normalized as, as an event, but I had to protect myself and go back into my art making process. I know I needed it personally. I needed this um, language to be freed as well. So it wasn't about forgetting. It wasn't about cutting myself off from what had taken place or what is still going on. It was about really using this channel uh, that is our language, our visual language that allows us to express what we are influenced by and how everything that is taking place outside completely is reverberating inside the studio space, which is by, which is like by transition, a reflection or of our inner. So this is unavoidable. It's like going back into like this full circle of creating work that is coming from somewhere, going back onto the psychological and creating this language, trusting it, going on with it. Yeah, it is, it is really like, a, like, really, it's a drawn diary. So here we're going to go to a few pieces that will be presented at the Piazza auction. Uh, I went to Beirut. I was lucky to be in Beirut when uh, Heba did her solo show at Ajial. And okay. is it about, please correct me, but it was a bit about the lost paradise with the flowers and we, it, we were... Um, again, the work is very autobiographical. It started with a research um, in religious scriptures on how heavens are described. And then I narrowed it down um, to one religious um, book. Then in the beginning, in the like middle of the preparation of this whole series, I had to let go of all this baggage that had to do with, with um, ancestors, upbringing, childhood, all this language we work with. And I had to dive back into psychoanalytical readings of Clarice Lispector and um, Julia Kristeva. And from that, I took the book Agua Viva, uh, read it over and over again, and just kept working. So I usually rely on um, a reading that can reflect back into the work and use the language as visual elements to create. So this is what happened in this series. It had to do with existential questions and um, the inner process or the, the fact of being a female Lebanese having lived here and abroad, having been exiled outside, going back inside and how is this um, lived on an emotional level. So yes, it is related to the description of the heavens and um, paradises, but then it evolved into being something else. Alors, I have a question I'm most probably going to ask each one of you. Yeah. Each time when people describe Lebanese, they say resilience, which is cut to my nerve lately, the idea of resilience. Because resilience is accepting, is doing what, what, what is, accepting what's going on and doing with it. Versus what is happening now, I think we are beyond resilience and Lebanese are starting to react and wanting changes. Uh, most probably because each of us, whether in Europe, in the States or Lebanon or wherever we are, we are stuck in the countries. It's more and more difficult to get visas, to go all over the world, etc. So do you think okay. that resilience is still the world for, for to go on? Most of us 
as artists, we are here by choice. Yani we have all been abroad, we, are, we have all lived elsewhere, we all came back, and we are here today really by choice. Our kids maybe are not here anymore, our parents are, and it's by choice that we stay here. Resilience or being positive or focusing on the good are all like words we can agree with or not agree with, really. It's, yani, the first month I was getting even offended by a simple smile coming from someone else because I couldn't smile myself. Um, we, we did not ask for this kind of, as an artist, I did not ask for this narrative to be thrown at me and for this kind of history to be imposed on me, but it has happened. And I think my position or my question now is more, how do I navigate the space between the tension of having lived that and wanting to go back into like my art making and having more of my hand lead the process than to have the intellect take control over it. So I'm at that phase at this point. I'm in the, I'm at the space that really falls in, in between the outside and the inside or the outer and the inner. Um, and then it's very, it's, I mean, each of us, we, we take what we can and we go on. Some people want to feel resilient, but I feel like you said, it's like we are way beyond that. Beyond. Anna, I am taking it day by day. I know today I'm good. I don't want to waste it. I want to be like creating works. I want to be mindful that I can do best for myself. Um, so yeah, I don't know what okay. I answer. Yeah, of course. Anyway, there is nothing expected. I, know, I, question, know. I mean, this question and you say whatever you feel. You, we, I thank you, and we go on with uh, Gregory now. Most probably after you'll get back to the screen talking and discussing, uh, answering each other. So now, yeah. voila, this is another piece that I love that is, it's gonna be also, it's a triptych. Uh, yeah, I put some details. I mean, it's yeah, more than, right. yeah, it's, it's like a miniature. It's uh, absolutely beautiful and so subtle. And somehow it looked, mind you, a bit more peaceful at the time when, when, uh, when, uh, when you look at it. So now we're gonna go to Grégory. Thank you, Joanne. Oh, thanks. Grégory, where are you? Hello. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Grégory. Grégory, I thought, first of all, I said, well, Grégory is a photographer, then, no, Grégory is an art historian, then Grégory is not a photographer, because I found out that the photographies are called paintings, and you are right, these are almost like paintings, and uh, Grégory uh, is nowadays, if after also our discussion, Gregory is writing a lot. He's writing a lot about what's happening, like a diary, like a memory, like being what he told me, haunted by Lebanon. So I'll let you tell me about it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joanna, for this uh, beautiful introduction. Um, I, I would start. Would like to start with with uh, last subject you had uh, with Hiba. I think it would be a good introduction about this notion of resilience. Okay, great. I would say, yeah, because you and you said a word. You said that I'm haunted, or we are haunted, and yes, we are haunted. And now, uh, rather than than resilience, what we are feeling is rage. We are really enraged. We feel rage, we feel fear, we feel sorrow, and we definitely uh, do not feel anything that relates to normality. Uh, now, uh, back to what, I, what am I? Uh, am I an artist, a photographer, uh, an art historian? Well, I studied art history and I can say I became an artist because of this country. Uh, so I can say that Beirut and its crazy history made, uh, obliged me somehow to become an artist. So uh, I, I never uh, studied art. I studied art history and I teach art history at Alba. Uh, and then, uh, 
10 or even more years ago, I started doing things. The first piece I did, it was after the war of 2016. It was a short video. And then I did photography. But I say I'm not a photographer, meaning that I use photography when I, uh, when I need to say something about the photography. The image you see on the screen, for instance, uh, it's a photograph, but I'm not the one who took the picture. I'm the one who is in the picture. So it's rather a photographed performance, but it's not a performance because it was reality. It's a picture of myself in the rubble of Sosso Palace uh, one week after the explosion of the port. And uh, I want to uh, try to help safeguarding uh, this uh, heritage. Uh, and uh, here you see me with a painting that was shattered. And it happens that this uh, palace was the subject of my master's thesis at the Sorbonne, um, uh, art history master thesis, 25 years ago. And then uh, later on, when I became an artist and I worked on Beirut, I, uh, my, uh, I did my PhD about abandoned dwellings in Beirut. And this PhD was directly related to an artistic project I uh, showed at Cerso Museum in 2018. And what happened after this explosion is that everything I have worked on since I was a student have completely melted up altogether. So when I did my master's thesis, I was work, an art historian working on 17th century Italian paintings. And then I uh, became an artist slash researcher working on the city and its history. And, uh, and now uh, I'm in the middle of this mess, on this, of this cow or on, in this city of, in ruins. And I'm trying to uh, reassemble the pieces. So we are now in a very uh, strange situation. Uh, yeah. You said I'm writing a lot. Yes, I'm writing a lot in uh, order not to publish necessarily everything I wrote, but I to to have uh, to. I'm try. I, I would say that writing is a is part of a documentation, an extensive documentation of what is happening related to the city, related to people, related to habitat. And I'm uh, processing uh, what's, uh, what's happening with, uh, with us, with me, with my practice. So uh, when I photographed the abandoned uh, dwellings, and you see an example that's eight year old on the screen, another that five years old on the screen, uh, there is a human presence, and uh, there was a human presence. So this is this was the performative aspect. Uh, this human presence was necessary for me in order to introduce, reintroduce life in these places that were inhabited by people and that became emptied from the inhabitants. And uh, my the photographs of myself in the rubble now, it's as if it was the mirror of the pictures I did previously. Uh, so instead of being the photographer photo, uh, picturing someone Gregory, else. We don't, we don't hear you. Would you repeat? Gregory, we don't hear you. But you didn't hear anything? Uh, Joanna, I think it's your mic because we hear him very well. We do hear. Uh, ah, so I'm, I'm not hearing. Hello? Uh, oui. Uh, allo, uh, pardon, Grégory. Oui. Do you hear me? Uh, Joanna, can I uh, give you a small comment? There's this funny green line. I think you can disconnect the share and share again. Yeah, share I, don't, again. I don't know from where it comes. Okay. Yeah, I, I will tell you where it's coming. Okay. There is a small uh, pencil on the side of the screen. By mistake, you must. I have know. I don't know what from where it's coming. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Oh. Just uh, unshare and share again. Stop sharing and share again. It will go. 
Oke. Okay. Nah. Hmm. you are right. Yeah, it's here. Okay, Joanna, don't don't worry, it doesn't matter. Okay. I'm sorry. It's I don't know how to take it out. Is it it's okay? okay? It's okay. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, d'accord. So, Gregory? Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Um, maybe if you ask me some question, because here I'm a little bit lost in my... Uh, you were talking the, about, uh, you were talking about the fact that the spaces, you would always bring a human element so that uh, you share. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, th there was this thing that uh, I, I wanted to bring the, the human uh, person in the photographs. And for instance, the picture you see now on the screen is a photograph I used for the cover of the book. And I chose a, a house that was not ruined. Uh, so that if you don't see the, the dust, uh, on the ground, you can imagine that it's a normal house that in, that's inhabited. And the idea was uh, to, uh, I would say, to go back home, to recover the city. And this was the, 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 main, uh, the main message I wanted to convey uh, to the public when I exhibited this project at Sursa Museum. And I had a lot of reactions from the public, from persons who recognized their homes, who told me stories. Uh, so there, re there really was this idea of recollecting uh, what has been lost during the wars, uh, especially the 1975, 1990 armed conflict. And uh, due to all this real estate speculation that destroyed much of the heritage in Beirut and let uh, many inhabitants leave their homes to go el elsewhere. And now uh, seeing the city devastated, see Sirso Museum where, where I had my exhibition devastated. So this is a picture I took at Sirso Museum in the day after the explosion. It's as if we had to start it again. Uh, but I, I wouldn't stay started again the same thing. It's, it's something completely different. Uh, and uh, uh, this idea, I know that we are many artists uh, that have been very affected by, uh, by, by everything that comes with this explosion. Uh, seeing my work and seeing the work of other artists, co colleagues, uh, it, it's as if it has something uh, prophetic. It, it, as it, if we we were in a situation of unrest and we were feeling that everything we live in is so fragile, and uh, it can uh, it can disappear in a second, and this is how it uh, happens. Uh, and also, it answers a question. Uh, that is often asked to Lebanese artists, why is war uh, so present in your work? Why are our conflicts so present? Why is ruin so present? Why is devastation? Why precarity? Why discomfort? Well, because we live in discomfort, even if we, we have sometimes in our lives a very comfortable life and we can travel, we could travel, now we cannot travel anymore, and we could go out, restaurants, bars, clubbing, etc. And uh, for the past years, Beirut was somehow the epicenter of the Middle East for art and, uh, and design. But we felt something extremely, uh, we, we, as we had this menace over our heads. Uh, Gregory, I want to ask you something because at the beginning you said something very interesting, saying it's living in Beirut that made of you an artist. Again, we're talking of to be able to handle a situation, sublimate, and I think creating is part of it. So would you consider Beirut a muse for you or is it more uh, the, 
the situation, the instability that made you creative, or it could be both, of course, but would you be, would you be inspired yeah. by another city? Would you write about another city or it's really mingled with your personal creative sphere? Well, uh, it's very difficult to answer uh, to the question, what would you have done if you were elsewhere? Uh, we, we cannot live our life again, but I know that, or I think that I wouldn't have done what I did. Now, I must say that it is the city itself, it's a city that always has been unstable, uh, even during the war, when you see the urban history of Beirut, it's a city that has always been in a process of changing, of morphing. It's a city, when you see the image of the city since the 19th century till now, for the past 200 years, uh, it hasn't been stable for more than 10 years. So it is a city that is always in transformation. It's a city that always in a threat of something. There are always wars, there are always migrations, people coming, people living, there are periods of prosperity, so people are building, and then again wars and the miseries, so uh, the city is not Very separable lively. from from what's happening in the city. Yani, uh, it, it's not that what we are living is, now it, it is exceptional, but uh, personally, I have lived the Lebanese war for all, all my uh, uh, childhood years were during the war and my teenage years too. Uh, and so I have experienced this notion that is not normal somewhere else. And there is uh, an attachment to this city that is visceral. We have a relationship of love-hate. So sometimes we want to leave it. And this is the situation of the, all the Lebanese now. Everybody who is in Lebanon now wants to leave. And all the Lebanese who are outside Lebanon want to come back. All my friends who are abroad, when I talk with them, they are crying and tell me we want to take the first plane and come back to Beirut. So there is something so visceral. Uh, so it's more than a muse. I would say it's... Uh, and I cannot even consider living uh, without Beirut. Okay. Gregory, thank you very much. We'll, of course, get back to you later on. And now we're going to move to Nada. Nada Dups. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello, 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 Nada. Nada, we're going to talk, of course, about identity and resilience, as we said, and also multicultural multi multi um, uh, creativity, because you create puns and links, as we're going to see it in our diaporama, with different cultures, also always with, with craftsmanship. So here we have images of your uh, shop and your office before, and after the blast. Well, destroyed. Voilà. So I was expecting Nada to leave because Nada, the majority of her family lives in Japan. She uh, grew up abroad, uh, studied abroad, may has money. She could really definitely also go easily abroad. And yet, even though we have this situation today, it was it has been already repaired. And she is even more inspired by Beirut because she want to help. So you told me, I want to even more work with craftsmanship. I want to even more be in Beirut and help. So would you tell us about it, please? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Joanna. And thank you for inviting me to this art circle. I love always talking on Zoom because you get so many interesting perspectives. So, um, so when the blast happened, I didn't really think that it was going to ruin, you know, I felt, I never thought it would be this bad. I was so shocked when I came next day and saw this, uh, the whole boutique falling apart and my studio, maybe 60% of the furniture pieces have all been destroyed. But my, my reaction is always to be constructive. There's something about 
the way my, uh, I function. And if I go back to the way I work, actually, we were talking about resilience, but I think it's not about resilience. It's about Beirut has been a place where people just adapt. So, for example, you know, we've had, you know, the Ottoman Empire, we had, you know, the French coming in. And each time, even if you look at the architecture, there's these, you know, the influences of the different cultures that come in. And then I come 20 years ago from Beirut, uh, from uh, London, but I grew up in Japan. I lived in the States and the UK. When I came to Beirut, I felt that, um, you know, I, had, I was a bit lost about who I was. I thought that when I come back to the Arab world, maybe I will find who my, what my identity is. And I realized that I didn't relate to the people so much. And through my work, which brought out the Japanese aesthetics as well as the Middle Eastern craft, I actually found the answer to my identity crisis. And that is really about duality and about how we can bring the best of both and put it together and uh, create a new identity. So I feel like what we do in Beirut is keep creating new identities for ourselves. And for me, I'm just using furniture as, as a reference uh, to do that. So, and what to me is so important is really not Beirut the city, but it's Beirut the people. And I really feel that I felt when this whole blast happened that, of course, there are people who are leaving the country, they want to go, but I felt that what about the people who are still here, who cannot go? And I felt like if I'm not there to help, especially the craftsmen, the people who, who keep um, the culture as it is. It, is, it is our craft, it is this heritage that we have to preserve, I guess in architecture as well. And I know there's a lot happening in architecture regarding this. So for me, the idea of preserving uh, our craft and preserving our heritage became more important. And I'm having a hard time. I mean, Joanna, you're trying to invite me to Paris and I'm having had such a hard time leaving Beirut because I feel like I'm so needed here. Um, not me as a person, but as someone who's representing, uh, you know, um, you know, a modern identity to traditional craft. And so this period of time has given me so many ideas. And I've been like, you know, um, I've become very creative. And one of the things I was thinking of doing is this, uh, the boutique downstairs uh, is completely destroyed. The mirrors are, is completely bashed. The ceiling has fallen. Um, and what I want to do is just put a facade and I want to keep it as a little memorial for the next few months or the next year. Be and what I've done is I've picked up fallen apart windows that cannot be put together again and trying to make pieces out of it <laughs> so that it becomes uh, maybe like, um, you know, not a reminder, but maybe adding something positive to it, adding a craft to it. Transforming. Uh, transforming it and something new and uh, you know possibly selling it uh, to benefit an NGO or something but the, and not only me I would like other people if they have something that represents their uh, you know either the pain or something positive about not positive it's not that positive but something that uh, you know we can do with what we have and I think that this is what we've been doing all along anyway as designers, um, we're always working with what we have. And so now we're limited with certain things. And um, I don't know if that's a very Japanese thing when I, when, you know, you learn to work with constraints. I mean, I'm, I enjoy working with constraints. So this is where, what we have now, and I'm going to try to do the best with what we have today. Hello. This is something very important also about tradition and, and uh, modernity, contemporaneity, is the fact that not only with Lebanon does Nada work with craftsmanship, but she also helped an NGO in Afghanistan who used to wave wonderfully well carpets, but traditional ones, and she took them 
in our 21st century. And, and as we we're friends, she used to talk to me about it. And she was very enthusiastic to work with these women and to see how they were mesmerized by the possibilities because what they know is only repeating what they've been doing for ages and they thought about. So Nada, it was a beautiful experience. Of course, we are auctioning these three carpets at Piazza, but uh, the experience is wonderful. So this is a, <clears throat> this was a very interesting project. So it's an initiative that empowers women carpet weavers in Afghanistan. And I was invited to come up with a car furniture collection, uh, sorry, a, a carpet collection. But when you really think about it, everything almost has been done in carpet design. You know, they've, they've uh, uh, dyed them, they've shaped them, they've done so many things. And instead of coming up with a new design or new pattern, I decided I'll just keep the traditional and introduce the modern and maybe a new identity is formed. So if you can see there's a duality, but this is a carpet uh, in the screen before maybe. Uh, in the carpet you'll see that, or the next, maybe the next uh, screen. It shows the, uh, how you can see the, um, the old and the new as woven together as one piece. And, and, you, and it's, I call this collection You and I, because it's like a love story between the old and the new. Um, and, uh, and then together, like you love, you know, when two people come together, there's a synergy that's formed. And here you can see that with the change of texture and color and uh, pattern, I created this new identity in the rugs. So this was a very, very um, interesting exercise and, uh, and you know, at the same time, of course, they have to be functional. So composition wise, you can put furniture around it, etc. But I've seen it on a wall. And, and as a matter of fact, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have enough space at Piazza. But if we can see it there, I'm sorry, I'm coming with the images. Look at the wall. I mean, it's a beautiful as if it's a painting. It's a beauty when you're seeing hand on the wall, which happens more and more often to carpets. As a matter of fact, I've seen more and more carpets being hanged. About carpet, here is a carpet that is collected by Matthaf. It's in their permanent collection. And it was a quite big surprise for me when I've seen it for the first time. Um, I saw it, I think, at Dubai, in Dubai, no? Uh, in, uh, at the, um, this was in uh, Munich at the Haus der Kunst. Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe you saw it in Sharjah. Sharjah. Oh, Sorry, oh, Sharjah. Sharjah. So would you tell us a bit about the alphabet and how it came? Because it's yeah. quite surprising. It's, it's, it's not, it's a piece, it's a sculpture. It's a piece of art. So this is really uh, interesting because I was uh, asked by um, uh, Hutt Foundation to come up with an object for the uh, 100 year centennial at the Munich uh, Haus der Kunst Museum. So the whole idea was uh, how 100 years later, they had an exhibition 100 years ago, and 100 years later, what happened to Middle Eastern art and uh, design. And so, uh, you know, I guess I was influenced by my Japanese upbringing I decided to create, I, anyway, I'm obsessed with the, the idea of carpet design, but I decided to create a concrete carpet. So this is nine meters and three and a half meters wide. So it's a very, very large piece. And I used the 26 letters of the alphabet and they're laid out as if they're tatami uh, mats. And so there's a sense of organization in it. And what you see in, in the, uh, with, that's uh, carved into the concrete are just random uh, words. But each panel has uh, the one letter of the alphabet. So the one here you have is Ja. And so I just put uh, different words of using Ja. I actually contacted Samir Sayyid, who's a very well-known uh, calligrapher, and I asked him, what can I do? Because I wanted to have, have meaning in, in the words. And he said, no, you don't need to have meaning because just the rhythm of 
of saying the words and the rhythm of the way it's laid out, it looks like a traditional carpet. It's enough. You don't need to have more meaning. And what was, so what you see is like a little um, mother of pearl inlay done by hand on each of the panels describing the, you know, just to show that this is the alphabet, you know, each panel and what the alphabet is. So I showed this to an architect uh, uh, once and she's a, you know, theorist. And she told me, Nada, this is such an interesting carpet because when you think about it, the Arab world used to be like the thousand and one nights and we had the flying carpet in the past. It was exotic and you know, erotic and everything. And today we, the Arab world have become, has become so heavy. And this kind of represents the heaviness of the Arab world. But the mother of pearl, the way it shines and it has this glitter, maybe and uh, made by the hand maybe that's giving us a little bit of hope and maybe we will fly again in the future so this was really representative of um the arab world today so we're kind of weighed down a bit with the heaviness Hello. this i wanted even though well, and then we're going to finish with this i was very proud uh, for my friend to know that ikea went to her and asked her, please, would you do a whole capsule collection for Ramadan? Uh, and of course, we all tried to get few of them. It was sold out. Uh, and I was very happy for Nada, a bit frustrated. And she made a wonderful collection of trays and objects with, but I mean, we're going to go to Carlos, uh, Carlo, pardon, but the, 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 it was, we can find that here again, she talks about her geometry because she's quite obsessed with geometry, Nada. Very mm -hmm. often too, she talks about the, the, the weaving of geometry all over the world. So, uh, and we can, we can see it here, obviously, with the form and shapes she, she used and drawings on the, on the trays. Yeah, so, uh... For me, geometry, you know, I grew up in Japan among different nationalities and different religions. And as a child, I remember I'm always looking for this one universal language that people can relate to. And I found the answer many, many years later through geometry, because geometry is understood with no words. It's an emotional, uh, re people react emotionally to the repetition of geometry, etc. Of course, Islam used it in... Uh, to represent infinity and you know uh, God and uh, kind of this elation because it's abstract, but I felt that this is the way I can um, reach out to people and to connect people together because you don't need to ex explain geometry. So in uh, in this IKEA collection, I used it in different uh, you know ways, uh, smaller uh, scale, larger scale. And I played with that. So it was really a fun collection. And, uh, you know, I feel very um, proud, not just for me, but for the Arab world that, you know, um, they have actually come to an Arab designer and a female designer to do a collection. So um, this is one of my, um, I guess, highlights of my life, <laughs> in my work life. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Nada. <laughs> Thank you. And here we are with Carlo. Carlo. Carlo? Where is Carlo? Well, we ah. the... Here we are. Uh, I'm listening to you, but I, okay. Uh, I cannot see the screen. I don't know why. So now I'm showing, hello. it's going to be quite interesting because I'm going to yeah. give you a description. Do you have the screen? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Hello, we have again. Uh, a, a studio totally destroyed again a shock again wondering how someone can keep on going and be having the strength to go on and uh, create other projects so would you tell us please so hi everyone nada uh, i don't know how i'm gonna speak after everything you said <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and gregory of course uh, so for me, guys, Beirut is an experience. Everything that we live in Beirut is, uh, is an experience that is like, it's a full experience. It's a lifetime experience that you cannot live, I think, anywhere else in the world. Uh, when the blast happened, I was in Manukhayel in my studio uh, slash house. 
And actually, it's all gone. The walls fell down, uh, the ceilings, the everything. Everything was completely destroyed. So I had to move out. Uh, I had to move out. So I moved to my mount to the mountain house of the family. And uh, so, just for you know, the how the offices of my sister, brother, and father are all located in the Quarantina uh, Jemaize Manchayel area. So everything is gone. And since I'm the only designer architect of the family, the only thing that I've been doing is like repairing all these offices. So it's been now 40, 40 days that I'm working only on this. And I, I still now didn't have the time to understand what is happening in Beirut. Uh, it's, it's, it was very hard. The blast was very, very strong. Um, I am not at all in a mood of uh, creating some stuff. I'm more in a mood of repairing and helping other people. Uh, so the experience that we lived, that I lived after the blast directly on the streets were completely, uh, was very difficult. But uh, I think we should move on and take this as an experience that we lived to, to be able to create more and in better days and better stuff. Uh, so so if, I, if may, uh, may I, because for me, well, I read, uh, of course, uh, about your work. You are a little bit like an alchemist, somebody who experiences with material. So I understand that you want to repair because you go on from working with ceramics and working. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 it cuts. Can you call? Can you call me back? Can you repeat what you said? I said for me, looking at your work and reading about you, for me, it's like an alchemist because you like to work with material, different materials. You've been working with bronze, you've been working with ceramics, you've been, I mean, you, you like the fact that you intervene on material, you transform it, etc. So would you, and it's, I don't know whether it's the form or experiencing new materials in your work that is, I mean, I, I, I had the chance to, 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 to work in Beirut, but I also I got the chance to work in different countries, in Cape Town, in Dubai, in Paris, in many, many other countries, where we, we work a lot with craftsmen. For, for me, like Nada said, craftsmanship is, is very important. I only work with, uh, with uh, craftsmen on very limited editions. And I am uh, very, like in every piece, on, 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 the, on the very piece that I created, there is a part of Beirut inside. Uh, it can be from the textures, it can be from the experience, uh, it, it can be from the, uh, everything that we discover during the process that is part of this, of this piece. Uh, this is a collection that I work with my sister, uh, Marilyn, who is a ceramist. We worked on these tools in Cape Town. Um, we spent two months there and it was an experience working with different material, different uh, finishes of the bronze and, um, and uh, different people actually. Every stool is made by 23 people and uh, it's a long process uh, that reflects, uh, it, it was inspired by the fertility dolls of, the, of, of Cape Town. Um, and two of them are, 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 uh, will be shown in Piazza uh, in Paris on September 13th. Here they are. And what I, I love the details, all of it. And it's very, it's, it's, it's very strange, the feeling, because you would think it would be wood. You would think it could be ceramic. It could be bronze. It has a very strong sensuality about it. So the process is very long because we start with like mock-ups, then we scan in 3D and then we fix them on a computer and then we, uh, with a robot, we cut them and then we cast them again. So it's a long process uh, to, to get to this stage, actually. Hello. This is a piece, uh, it was quite breathtaking. It was done in a church. And you know, symbolically, Christianity starts the fish, a very strong symbol of Christianity. And it was displayed with other objects of uh, Carlo uh, in, 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 in the church. And what is uh, in, uh, in, it, in uh, uh, Milan during the Salone del Mobile 2019, correct? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and what is amazing about it, it's uh, uh, this fish, you're gonna see, he'll explain all the pieces. It's really like orfevrerie. It's like a piece of jewel, literally. 
and it's a bar. So, so they, so the Design Milan Week, like the the organization with whom I worked in Milan um, last year, asked me to 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 exhibit in a church. And uh, while we, I was working with my sister, we decided to work on a symbolic of this church because the, the church was empty and it's a desacralized church. Uh, that is in Milan in one of the it's, it's a small it's a small annex of the one of the biggest church in Milan and uh, we wanted to work on the altar of the of the of the church and we decided to work on a kind of a table but uh, we didn't want to work on a, on something that is um, uh, very uh, very simple and we we work on the symbolic of the fish and this bar is made with 5,000 discs of pink onyx uh, that is cut and uh, fixed by hand on a on a foam structure. Uh, it's 300 uh, kilos and it has two shelves from the back and a flat flat uh, f uh, flat top where you can um, where can you you can put like glasses, books, anything, bottles, anything. So it's three meter long. But it's a functional bar. It's a functional item. Um, it's really it's a piece. It's a sculpture. It's a piece of art. It's quite amazing. Alors, this again is, uh, um, I fell quite in love when I saw the whole presentation of all these cities. It's iconic uh, buildings and in different cities in the world. And, so, and go ahead. So, yeah, so it's a collection of containers. Uh, every, every marble piece is, is, uh, is crafted by hand. Um, every piece represents a different building or an architectural detail that you can have in one of the buildings across the world. Um, this is like uh, the one on the right. It's a detail of uh, of a detail of an architect called Carlo Scarpa from Italy. Uh, so we extruded them, we transformed them to create uh, unique pieces. And um, I had a chance to work with a with a very nice uh, guy who who worked with the marble, and it. it it, it, um, it was very difficult to, to create all these pieces, but we, we made it and it's all handmade with, with, uh, with love. Yeah, I mean, it's always what is very interesting in your work. It's always things which are, of course, uh, functional, but they really, really look like sculptures. I mean, whether it's the bar or it's the stools or these pieces. They are tiny, small sculptures, even though they are containers. Alors, this is a piece I'm taking, uh, and it's a this quite is, amazing piece. Uh, this, is, this, is the most, this is the most tricky piece of the moment, because um, since I, uh, I created this piece three years ago, and uh, actually, it's the neighborhood where I live. It's it's a it's a it's a small mock-up made in pure silver uh, that I worked with like uh, talented craftspeople in Italy. It's a forty centimeter by forty centimeter by forty, and it's a mock-up of my street of of the street of Manchael that completely blew uh, blow was bl blown up by oh. the explosion. And um, as we know, in the street, you have a very famous uh, ice cream shop called uh, Oslo. You have the church and you have a building um, created, uh, a, a future building that, has, that should be created by, by uh, uh, designed by Snoeta and is a, is a headquarter of the BLF Bank that is supposed to be um, uh, built in the coming years. And this is, uh, it's a, um, it's a um, it's a jewelry box, and every piece that you can see on this uh, on this mock-up can be worn. So you have a brooch, you have a ring, you have a small box pill box, you have uh, the so the 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 ceiling not the ceiling the roof of the church can be taken off, and you can put you can hide stuff inside. So every every piece that you can see here uh, can be can be worn, and um, and it's very funny because. It's uh, it's uh, so the duality today between what's happening in Manchail and and uh, and this piece is for me uh, very uh, how I'm gonna say it it's very tricky because it's like a piece of for me it was my life this neighborhood <laughs> was my life uh, it was it is where you have all the artisans all the craftsmen all the bar all the restaurant that are completely blown away. And uh, so this piece, I, I decided to offer this piece to an NGO, 
if if all, so all the the benefits of this piece will go to an NGO, uh, and uh, the money will be donated to 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 all the people who live in this area. So, what about resilience, please? <laughs> I hate this world lately. Um, thank you. <laughs> Me too. I hate it. So, uh, good, please. So there is no resilience. You know, as I said, it's an experience. Today we live in experience. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stay and, and wait. Uh, I, I didn't have time to think about it clearly because I'm, I'm really in, in, in uh, sites working to fix uh, offices and, and apartments. Uh, I didn't have the time to think about what happened. I, I, I clearly want to, but it was very hard for me in, this, in the, the three first days. But after you, you realize that there is a lot of uh, people. Uh, who lived uh, the same experience and I think we should move forward but we should never forget I really think that a memorial should be done in this area in the port and in Jamaiza or Mankhail a memorial is very important for the city uh, because it will allow us to think about what's happening because we always have a tendency in Lebanon to forget about everything and move forward and then I think it's, it is we don't have the right to forget anymore about what happened because the atrocity and the, 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 so it was so big and it was, it, there was so much destruction in a fraction of a second that, that we are not, we, we cannot forget what happened. And it is very important to, to have uh, a, a kind of, uh, of memorial for this. So, we're gonna so, we, we we now what i'm gonna propose is maybe if there are any question barbara so here i'm gonna show you the the auction you can go on the site of piazza and you you'll have all the work displayed by nada carlos gregory hiba and many more and at the end if you're interested i added the phone uh, the email of each one of the participants, if you want to contact them, you want to see, you get, you want to get any information. So, voila, the PowerPoint is, will you do whatever you want with it? It's yours. And, uh, and are there any questions? Well, they were very eloquent and they said a lot, but maybe there are one or two questions. I wanted to, to add something to what Gregory was saying about why are we constantly asked, why are we always working with the subject of Beirut? Why is it a repetition? Art making is a reflection of what we are surrounded with. It's our daily life. So this discomfort that we inhabit living in the city of Beirut is the place where this work is coming out from. Yani like it or not, if we chose it or not, then uh, the languages do change from artist to artist, of course, but I like this word discomfort that Grégory used that is so important because we live in this discomfort zone constantly. We are reminded of it. And we hope that to yani, <laughs> go beyond it at some point, not be reminded anymore. And the one, that what was interesting is all of you know about it and all of you uh, gives you, you know, like being on the edge. It's not something good. It's not something bad. There is nothing Manichaean about what I'm going to say, but it's, you'll have to keep on creating because it keeps you alive. We are who we are because of Beirut, actually. I think we voilà. all have a common, thing, a common sense. We are, as I said, it's an experience. Beirut is, is what made us, for all of us, for, for, for Nada, for Hala, for me, for Gregory, and for all the others. And um, and today it's it's uh, we cannot we cannot leave. I think there is so many people leaving the country. I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious to see how they are living with everything happening in the world. And there is so much to do here. I'm just I'm just a bit uh, wondering how they are living. How they are living with all this uh, this problem. I, I I don't judge them, but uh, but uh, so Be Beirut has like has so much to bring on the table today, especially with everything what's happening today. We need everybody here. I, I don't know, this is my kind of my opinion. And I know I understand why they are leaving, but like people like me and Nada, I don't think that I can leave now. It's, 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 it is impossible. I can go, okay, I can go for a month or two, but 
but leaving Beirut for good, it's impossible. It, it is who we are. It is, this is how we create stuff. But may, may I tell you something? I'm somebody who's linked to Beirut surprisingly because, okay, I'm Lebanese, but I grew up in France. My life is in France. I've never lived in Lebanon. But somehow, even getting back to Paris and, you know, looking at the news and what is happening, it's as if Lebanon is an, uh, an amplifier of all the problems that are happening all over the world. You know, it's, it's uh, like a nerve center, you know, because you have also the social issues, the ecological issues, the corruption issues. I mean, everything that you can, religious issues, all the problems that, that you can have happening all over the world, ethnic issues, immigrant issues. I mean, they are all centered, amplified, and, 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 and existing in Lebanon. So what is happening in Lebanon is really, um, how you call it, like a renvoi d'image, like a mirror when you look at yourself and in a mirror, uh, and, and, and that's everything happening there is happening everywhere, elsewhere, maybe in a less violent way. So. Yeah, it is. It is exactly what you said. I mean, when I look at the news in, in France and, 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 I, and I read the news all over the world, it's not as if everywhere it's, it's softer or cooler. But in Lebanon, it's amplified because it's such a tiny, small country and geopolitically so important where it is. So. Uh, Joanna, sorry to interrupt. I would like to answer Asma Siddiq. She's asking, what did you feel that you had in the past that you think you won't repeat? I think, what did you have? like? in your art process, most probably as artists, designers, today and in the future after such a disastrous incident. Um, I would like to answer that for myself. I, I presently feel the need to simplify the intellectual process. I sort of called upon myself to stop or to like take a pose on being so analytical and so like complicating it on an intellectual basis and that just relying on what I already hold as a language and channeling it, letting it happen basically on a daily basis without any expectations of tomorrow. So. Alors, moi, where do you see the question? Because I don't see them. Uh, in the chat below. Moi, j'ai rien. Oh. Uh, en haut, ni en haut, ni en bas. But anyway, I'm, I'm more than happy with you now talking. So. Read the question oh, no. and decide which one. Dans, uh, uh, au, bas de la, au bas de la page, il y a, yes. de, uh, au centre, il y a Security Participant et Chat. Si tu cliques sur Chat, tu as le, la, la, la conversation. Uh -huh. Converser en français. Oui, oui. Mais, uh... Uh, one more question, Joanna, please. Yes. Uh, if you can, some people are asking uh, privately to have the emails. So I think it's in the last page of your presentation. Yeah, it's in the if, last, look, I'm going to show it to you. If you, have, you can go there, some people would like to take probably a photo. Yeah, keep of course. It. This, this is it, this is it. So if, if any of you would like to take a photo of the emails, here they are. Here they are. Thank you, Joanna. No, rien. Is any one of you want to add, answer a question? Attendez, partage. Yes. So uh, you were all talking with your heart, so it's maybe difficult you know, to uh, ask question at this moment. And I think that everything that you, you said and all the information that you gave us, um, fulfill us, so maybe that's why people are silent tonight. Anyway, the participants were quite eloquent. They were very clear and subtle in their way. I mean, it was very, I mean, it was a pleasure for me to share this moment with the four of you, really. Thank very you, much. Joanna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, pleasure and an honor for us to be, to be here. To be here. Yes, thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you for animating such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Nada, Hiba, Carlo, and Gregory. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. It was very nice. 
Yeah, you. It was very easy to start for. Before leaving, no, I had another. Leave, it was very interesting to see how each one reacted in its different way to the to the tragedy we had. Uh, one is busy with the architecture and the refixing. The other one is just going, and uh, and Hiba is uh, her her creation creativity is flowing without analyzing. It's interesting to see how each one uh, reacted in a in their own way. And before leaving you tonight, may I remind you about the From Beirut Art and Design Scene auction in Paris as at Piazza Auction House on the 30th of September. Again, we hope that you will join in to make this auction a real success. On behalf of the Art Circle Board, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. Let's God bless Lebanon, the Lebanese people, and the Lebanese art scene. Stay safe. See you soon. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.